All right, we're live. So I'll just get everyone into the room now, Pat. I'll just do a quick introduction. Thanking you. Thanking everyone. Just a few quick uh, guidelines how to use this program we're using. And I'll uh, get started then. All right, so we're good to go. Um, welcome everyone to this uh, second webinar of our uh, COVID that we're keeping engaged with the community. My name is uh, Liam Warren. I'm the communications director for uh, the Newfoundland Labrador Rugby Union. Uh, we're very thankful to have Dr. Patrick Parfi join us today. Um, I ask for any of you that are joining us via Zoom that you please leave your, turn your videos off and you are automatically mute, uh, muted. So we'll start with a few questions. We have a special guest, Mr. Tim Powers, who is the chairman of Rugby Canada and a proud Newfoundlander who will be joining us around eight o'clock Newfoundland time. And if anybody has any questions throughout this, there's a raise your hand feature. So please do that if you would like to ask Dr. Parfrey a question or you can message the question to me. Uh, my name is Liam Warren and I'll be sure to ask Dr. Parfrey it. All right. So Pat, um, who or what got you involved in the sport of rugby first? Jesus, I'm, I'm, too, old. I'm too old to remember that. But uh, I, went to, I went to a school, a high school in Cork at the age of uh, 12 or 13. And that was a rugby playing school. And uh, as a result of that, you automatically played rugby. Um, so I just played rugby throughout my school, my school at high school, six years. Mm -hmm. So what position did you start off playing and then did you keep playing that position throughout your whole playing career? No, I think in the very initially games, I might have been second row and then I moved to the midfield. And mm -hmm. from virtually for my entire life, I've been either an outside half or a centre. The only time I played in the wing was when I played representative rugby for Munster. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you played a bit with Munster. How did you, what was like... How did you find that experience? How was it um, different from like, well, it's, it's a pretty high standard and big achievement. So I guess if you could give us a little overview of your time with Munster, I guess. So I left school and went to University College Cork when I was, uh, when I was 18 and uh, played on the, uh, played for Monster in 1969 when I was 19. In fact, my first experience was as a, as a substitute for the South Africa game between Munster and South Africa in mm -hmm. Dolman Park. And at that time, subs never played, so you were just ho you were just hoping that somebody would get injured in practice. So I never, I didn't actually get to play. And then subsequently, I, I played for Munster until 19, 1977. Um, mm -hmm. And at that time, the, the major games were you had three interprovincials uh, against Connacht, Ulster, and Leinster. And the major mm -hmm. games were the, were the touring teams that came in from. Uh, New Zealand and Australia and uh, Argentina and other other countries. Mm -hmm. So on that note, actually, that's a good lead into my next question. So you played against the New Zealand All Black with the Munster representative team. That was a, resulted in a draw of three and three. That must have been very exciting. Do you have any highlights from that match? Well, <laughs> the only the only thing I can remember is that uh, I have astigmatism. And uh, as a result of having the astigmatism, I was a bit concerned that if I was to play in the wing, that uh, when I was on the far side of the field, that I wouldn't be able to see the ball being thrown into the line out and pass into mm -hmm. the scrum half. So I got a pair of contact lenses made and they weren't those soft kind of contact lenses. They were thicker, harder ones. Um, mm -hmm. And they were slightly irritating. And uh, during the game was played in a very sunny day. And as a mm -hmm. result, the, uh, the, the contact lenses started to irritate me. So I had to take them off at half time. 
And uh, in, in, that, in those days, there was a lot of kicking from 10. And uh, when I was on the offside wing, I could never see the ball been passed to the 10 and had to make a, a judgment about how people were moving around the field about where I actually should be. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's probably my biggest memory. Yeah, it's a, on that note, I guess the technology of eyewear has definitely come a long way. Myself, I wear glasses in. Um, I remember World Rugby, they came out with this pair of goggles. So I wore those for a few years. So it was definitely, that's one thing I just took away from that comment you made. Um, Sean Gillespie has a question here. He said that you've actually played against New Zealand five times. And I was actually going to go on to that. You said you then received a cap with the Ireland national team against all blacks as well. How did it feel to represent your country in such an important form? Well, I suppose it was, a, to some extent, it was a dream come true because there wasn't much of a run into it. We, I played for the Irish universities against the All Blacks in 74 and then played a few days later for Munster against the All Blacks. And they picked the Irish team after that, that game. And uh, the concern at the time was they had a winger called Brian Williams. And the concern was that um, they wanted to get a defensive player, I suppose. So as a result of, I was picked to play on the wing for Ireland, which uh, like I was as slow as a wet week. And uh, they, I was kind of using my brains to defend, um, mm -hmm. but, but nonetheless was selected. But my biggest memory of that is that on the two days before the game, I pulled my adductor magnus, my groin in training. Mm -hmm. And uh, I contacted uh, a mentor in Cork called Noel Murphy, who was a selector for the Irish team. And he mm -hmm. said, Pat, get on the field. You might never fucking play again. So mm -hmm. the following day, I had a, I had a fitness test with a fella, with the winger from Ulster who would replace me, who was twice as fast as me on a normal day. And Donald Kenneth, who was the reserve scrum half, and he was my friend. So mm -hmm. I ran at half pace. And Donald ran at half pace. And when I reached the 50-yard line, the, the winger who was going to get my place was finishing. But I refused to cry off. And the following day, I had an injection in my Dr. Magnus and uh, played the entire game. That's a good moment. Though. Yeah, that's something I never knew. Um, we have a question here from David Wells. I believe it's Senator Wells. So I'll uh, hand him over to you there, Pat. So I'll unmute you here, uh, Senator Wells. Um, it's up to you if you want to show your video. It's up to you. I think if you, you're on muted there now, Senator Wells. Oh. Right, there we go. Right. And uh, hi, Pat, and hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for doing this. This is a, a great idea, a great forum, and a great way for, our, for all of the old... Uh, the gang and the new gang to stay together. Pat, when you first came over, I think it was 83 or 84, I remember uh, very well Noel telling us, you know, that we got this guy coming over from Ireland, he's all that and more. <clears throat> we didn't know what to make of you. Uh, what, was your, what was your thought when you had decided to come to Newfoundland? Uh, did you, was one of the first things you did check out the rugby scene? Or like, what was your, what was your whole path of uh, ending up at the Swilers? And what did you think when you got here and saw, you know, just a bunch of guys who were doing reasonably well, but had not a lot of skill? You're muted. Oh, that's one second. He must. Oh, all right. Sorry about that, Pat. You were muted there. I don't know what happened. So uh, nobody heard what you said. Sorry about that. So, Davey, um... So the, the story was, I, I was a doctor and still am, and uh, was got, got offered a job about three, about April of 1984, um, during the, the ice storm that was present in Newfoundland at the time. And to my wife's surprise, I decided that I really liked my visit to St. John's and it was very like the community from which I came, Cork, a university town, lots of hills and family oriented. So we arrived in July and I had decided that I wasn't going to have any involvement in rugby uh, because I was a young doctor trying to make my, make my way in life from an academic perspective. And um, 
I went to a party uh, in a, a, a doctor's house called Happer Mangan. I don't know, about a, mo a month after I arrived or a bit later, I, I can't truly remember. But uh, uh, Noel Brown was at the party and he collared me and uh, I told him, no, I didn't want to be doing any coaching or playing or anything. I just wanted to get on with my life and give rugby a break. Anyway, he persuaded me to go into the game the following day on a Saturday at the um, at the ground there uh, with the gym, with the, the building there and uh, Torbay. Yeah. So I went up and then he persuaded me to go to the, uh, the breezeway with him. And seven pints later, I was late, late going home to a dinner party and uh, I had agreed that I would uh, get involved and we'd go on tour and I was roped in by Noel Brown. Then uh, uh, the next thing was I was invited to uh, a meeting of the of the players in in uh, Le Bats. Uh, and that was an eye opener with <laughs> with beers and let's run across tables and arguing the loon and a few other guys in their element. Didn't bother me actually. I was quite quite happy with the the fact that there was twenty five players there wanted to do something, and as a result of that meeting, we we went to Ireland the following year, which I think might have been the the greatest rugby tour I was ever on, just from the perspective of uh, fun and games and etc. Um, I we were I think we arrived in Shannon, and uh, went to Galway and. Um, you were on it, Davey, right? Jeez, I'm just getting over it. <laughs> <laughs> and the first night, the first night we were there, we we're in the in, a, in the hotel in Air Square, and the entire team was still up at three o'clock in the morning. And I can just remember myself with a bottle of rum, and there was twelve players with their glasses out, and I just ran along a table with the bottle turned over. And we were playing Shannon Rugby Club a few days later. Who were the championship team in, in Ireland at the top uh, and, and became had had an unbeaten season, and uh, we were their first opposition. And it was actually it, it was a, a memorable occasion because we played in Thoman Park. We got well beaten, but we weren't disgraced. And then uh, we played them in the Black Rock Festival about ten days later, and uh, we went from a beating of thirty three points to something something small to uh, losing by three points at the Black Rock Festival. So uh, I think everybody who was on that uh, thought it was a memorable occasion and great fun. And I can remember you passing me a ball against Kilkenny to drop a goal in the last three minutes of the game for us to be win 6-3. So anyway, it was, what did you, did you, did you have a good time, Davy? You know, <laughs> as I said, I'm just getting over it now. Uh, and that was in the early 80s. I was, uh, I was amazed at, the, of course, the level of rugby. I'd never seen anything like that. Uh, but, you know, and, and even playing in front of more than family and friends, which is essentially what we had here in St. John's when we played. It was, you know, four teams and, 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 uh, and your cohort of, of, of fans, which was your, your, your buddies and, 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 and maybe, a, maybe family. And uh, so going over there, playing in, you know, real rugby stadiums and you know not just the not just the game part of it and that's a you know I always I've always seen rugby as a gentleman's game uh, but not just the game part of it but the camaraderie after the game uh, where both teams get together have a few pints have a few laughs tell a few stories some of them are true and uh, you know you can make lifelong uh, friendships from them that's one thing I take from uh, from our from our tour of Ireland, uh, you know, it's uh, I think it was fourteen or fifteen days of not a whole lot of sleep uh, and a lot of rugby and a, a lot of singing uh, and a little bit of drinking. Um, and you know, you go on so many uh, for me, especially I go on. You know, I travel around as as part of my job. I've been to dozens and dozens and dozens of countries and done you know very interesting things. But the one trip I remember and I can tell stories about sometimes, uh, is that trip uh, and the, you know, the friendships that you make and the friendships that you solidify among your teammates. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's a, it's an important, it was an important part of my 20s uh, that lives with me and stays with me to this day. And I also think that was an important part of the development of Newfoundland rugby because 
you had a batch of players who actually trained pretty hard and played pr pretty hard and they went and played the best teams in Ireland. You know, that was the amazing thing. And uh, played in, in the primary festival of rugby at that time, the Black Rock Festival. Uh, and then came back and we kind of did things that as a result of that trip, like uh, building a club or buying a clubhouse downtown and building a field and et cetera. Uh, and, and kind of start, it started the tradition of touring that's gone on for a long time. Um, you know, so I think that was a very formative uh, trip for for rugby in Newfoundland. Yeah, absolutely. It was uh, uh, memorable and uh, real character building for uh, for me. And I know a lot of the mates that uh, that were on the trip. Yeah. Well, your first of all, your decision to come to Newfoundland and not uh, get involved in rugby, so that worked out fairly well for you. <laughs> But Pat, you're, uh, just, to, just to finish on, on my comment, uh, you've been a great credit to the sport, a great credit to the Swilers, and of course a great uh, credit to, to, to rugby, not just in Newfoundland and Labrador, but to Canada. So thanks for that. Thanks, Davey. Get him off. Get him off, Liam, for God's sake. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Senator Wells. We appreciate your time. Um, okay. So we'll move on to, we talked a bit about in Ireland, Pat, did you coach any rugby in Ireland or was it just playing there for you at that point? Well, I did, I co I co my school, when I left school and went to university, I coached the team uh, or helped coach the team for three years, probably uh, at Christian Brothers College. And uh, we didn't win a single cup when I was in college. And then we won three in a row when I left college. And then uh, I also coached the, the Munster under 20 team for a few years and then went to London and uh, mm -hmm. was was playing and was asked whether I'd like to be captain of the team or not but being the, being the, uh, the uh, type of person I am uh, I've said I'd prefer to be coach uh, and so I, I, knowing that the coach could never get sacked unless you, you were no good <clears throat> so I was the player coach for a number of years and then the last two years was predominantly a coach rather than a player coach. Yeah, I um, did a bit of reading on that. Um, you took on the role of player coach, like you just mentioned. Um, what were some of the challenges and benefits of that extra responsibility you found? Well, it was uh, it, London Irish was in education and politics because it, it comprised, uh, um, it was a big club uh, and it represented the diaspora from Ireland, both North and South. So you had a, a batch of players who were from Northern Ireland and a batch of players from the South. And the guys in the North of Ireland were generally Protestant. The guys in the South of Ireland were generally Catholic. And this was during the Troubles. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we just we just made it work. We had great fun. We enjoyed playing together, but the politics was uh, rapacious and uh, you know, there was always some coup on, on the go in, in London Irish to get rid of this or get rid of that. Um, mm -hmm. Fortunately, I had uh, I had better politicians on my side, but then the fellows who were trying to get rid of me or, or other That's people. We, but we, we, had a, we had a very good team and uh, we got to the, 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 well, the John Clare Cup final, which is, which is really the English Cup in mm -hmm. 1980. And... Uh, were beaten by Leicester, who were the dominant group of players of that, our group of team at that period of time. Yeah, you were actually, in my other reading I did too, um, I saw that you were the first coach to take the London Irish to that, to that cup final. That must have been a pretty big accomplishment for you. So I was just wondering, how did you motivate the team to perform well all season, I guess? Is there anything special you learned there that you then use later in your coaching and managing career here in Newfoundland? Well, I th uh, first of all, we are good players. Um, any team, that's the most important thing. You, you, they got to train, and uh, and then you you got to have a game plan, and uh, then how you deal with how you deal with players is a kind of a man management thing, um, and uh, uh, and in terms of motivating them to play above themselves, uh, I think that's probably one of my skills. Um, and I was I'd been young at the time. I was probably a desperate bastard altogether. Um, and it, it took me about 40 years to cool down. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's a little bit about your time there in London. 
So then from there, you went to Montreal to further your academics and your career. Um, this being your first time involved with the sport of rugby here in North America and especially Canada, from the start, like when you first got here, what was the biggest change for you with the sport between Europe and Canada? Well, I went on tour with them. Um with uh, London Irish to uh, to Ontario and Quebec in, I don't know, 1982 or something. I can't exactly remember when. Mm. But my God, the heat was a killer. And the grounds were like rock. And the uh, physicality of the teams was enormous. And the uh, the brutality of the tackling, et cetera, was, was a big change to what I was kind of used to. We'd win because we were better, we were better rugby players. So um, the, in, in, when I came to Newfoundland, you had s somewhat similar, but there were better rugby players. At least they had a better sense of the game and better sense of, of uh, becoming better rugby players. Um, so the important thing then was to stimulate some ambition to win games out of town and to prepare property for the games and try and go after winning national championships which I suppose that's probably what I was interested in, some way to demonstrate that we that in a small community we could be the best. Um, and it, it originally started as trying to demonstrate that we had a club that was the best in the country, and that derived from uh, that trip and that Davey's talking about in 1985. But the difficulty was, was there was no vehicle. The vehicle had to be through the provincial team and demonstrating that you could get a provincial team out of Newfoundland that could win a national championship. And um, we, we, we did very well in the, all, all told, I thought we did very well from about, you know, the late 80s onwards. Yeah, so when you were in Montreal too, that's a, that's a great uh, bit of hit, uh, knowledge there. Um, did you coach any rugby while you were in Montreal? I did. I coached for two years with Montreal Irish and enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Got into trouble at work because I was on call and played in a cup in a cup game and left my pager in the touchline, and they were they were paging me, looking for me during the game. And for some reason, nobody heard the pager, and I got into trouble for doing that. So you know, so that's probably a, 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 an adverse reflect a reflection on my. Uh, um, was the capacity for rugby. That's a good one. Um, so I guess you kind of had talked a bit about it before, but how is your experience of playing with the London Irish different than that of the Montreal Irish? Whatever, just a better rugby team. Sure, maybe Jesus. Maybe Montreal Irish was going back in time. You had to develop a team out of not very much, whereas in London Irish you had a team that could could have been professional if they were a professional rugby was the second best team in England, um, mm -hmm. and and stayed in the top was the best team in London for for several of those years, and it was certainly in the top eight in the country for the time that I was there. So it was just a, a very different experience. Uh, the experience in Montreal Irish was was about team building and teaching a small group of players how to play well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then when in Newfoundland it was it was a little bit different in that uh, there was a there was a an infrastructure already created and there was a group of people who wanted to play well um, and that built over time. Sure. So moving on now, I guess to Newfoundland here, where you've done so much for the sport and uh, just general fitness and well-being for all Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. Um, did you play any rugby in here in Newfoundland or did you just get involved in the coaching and managing roles? Well, I played with the Outlaw. I played for, uh, I played, I played for a year. <laughs> and uh, I retired after we won the Goodyear Cup in 1985. Um, and the only reason I was playing was that I had gone to Ireland. And the only reason mm -hmm. I played in Ireland is that we needed to have an outside half. And uh, as I used to say, nobody could run faster than I could kick it. So, uh, you know, I wasn't, I was 35 at the time and not, and, you know, not, not in good shape, etc. So that I stopped playing as soon as I was able to manage it. <laughs> Fair enough. So you talked a bit about how you got involved in the sport here, like uh, through 
Dr. Brown, who we're hoping to have on in a, for one of these webinars too, to talk a bit about his experience being the father of the modern day rugby here in Newfoundland Labrador. Um, what drove you to get involved, not just in the playing, but like the development of the sport of rugby here in Newfoundland? You better send a technician over to Noel before you, before you get him on the webinar. I hope you send Gillespie over to him to just help him out. Anyway, so, so anyway, your question was, why did I, why did I get involved, is it? I got yeah, involved. so like what? I got involved because I was persuaded to get involved by Noel Brown. That's the dominant reason. And then I was, I was a, a, rugby, a rugby nut. So as I got the sniff of it, I was, I was stuck in it for the rest of my life. Fair enough, yeah, like most of us. Um, throughout your time here in Newfoundland, what motivates you to continue being involved in the sport? Well, the, the, the biggest problem, not problem, but the biggest um, problem for me has been, uh, I, I would like to coach um, and uh, coach for as long as I could, but it was clear that other people needed to be, needed a coach. Simon Blanks came in, he was a much younger man. He needed a coach. Morgan came in, he's a much younger man. He needed a coach. Jeff Warden started coaching the Swilers. He needed a coach. Um, the under-19 team, there's other people like Brendan and Peter Densmore. They needed a coach. So uh, I, I suppose I kind of uh, stopped coaching because, not because I didn't want to coach. I actually wanted to coach, but because I have to give opportunity to younger, younger people. So um, when, it, when it became time to hand over the reins to other people. And I said, I get involved in managing teams and raising money so that they could go away and have a kind of a backdoor influence um, on, on how, how people team or how, how people play, like the keeper of the spirit type of mentality. Yeah, for sure. That's a, that's a good point there about the transition and the, we want to continue to build a sport here. It's a multi-generation sport. We want to continue to have all generations involved. So, we have some of our junior rock players uh, watching this webinar. Do you have any advice for them as they continue to grow with the sport? Well, we got to have the, they have to stick at it because they, now with with COVID nineteen, uh, we're we're in a in a, a, a time of great frailty. The game is frail in Newfoundland anyway because we don't have a large number of people playing, and now we're going to have a season where we're not going to play this year, I suspect, and even next year might be a problem. And I think that we'll be back to the back 50 years because we'll have to find, we'll have to ensure that the people who are playing now who are a smaller number than they were a few years ago play. And then we have to recruit. We're recruiting out of the high schools in the high school league. And if there's no league, how do we get them? So I think that we'll be back at a, at a kind of a start at a, at a, 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 a you know, we're, we're, we're under pressure, I think. And uh, mm -hmm. it has to be a major effort to, to get the game back in gear again. And at the, and the same time, we're going to be, have limitations with travel. And the thing that <laughs> the, the poor players and kept them in the game was being able to tour and play provincial championships and those types of things. They might be a bit slow to get back on, back on the ground again. So um, it, I, it'll, be, it'll require a big effort. And the, the effort is going to come from those guys who were... Uh, involved in last year's under 19 championship, for instance, they're key. Um, and if they don't stay involved, uh, we've got no group of people to uh, redevelop the sport. And then you've got the, the fellas who are going from the Swatters who are going to a club championship this year. Um, they, that club championship must be in doubt, but that was going to be a, an opportunity to uh, enhance the sport and have players play to a higher standard of rugby and get involved in preparing for stuff. Yeah, for sure. That uh, The COVID-19, that's um, one of the reasons why we're doing these webinars to try to keep people engaged, keep the profile of rugby present in the community and hopefully grow it. So we'll def there's a lot of discussions ongoing and ahead regarding that topic. So uh, it'll be, there, they're not gonna be easy topic discussions, but they're important ones for the continuation and the development of the sport here in Newfoundland. Um, I guess this one is kind of, you would have a lot of them. Uh, would you be able to share some of your favorite memories of your time of this, with the sport here in Newfoundland? 
my, some of my favorite memories that I, uh, couldn't be put put in public. Uh, so I'll, uh, I think I think that the the top rugby event in my life in my life, and having been involved in a large number of different types of things, was uh, uh, winning a national championship in two thousand and five in in Regina. Um, and there were a number of reasons why it was so so uh, such a big occasion for me. It was one it was that we had tried for a fairly substantial period of time to win one. Uh, the team had trained astonishingly hard and were as they were the fittest team that I was ever involved in and they were down 22-3 at half time and uh, went into the dressing room in Regina and uh, there wasn't a single word said by a player or a coach it was just like as if everybody says well we got these guys even though we were down 22-3 just let's get out there and win it and then they came we came out and they played superbly for for the in the second half and won the game comprehensively so there was a kind of a, a, a celebration having lost two national finals in the previous three years and it was the best celebration I've ever been at because uh, there was a downstairs dressing you went down 10 steps and you went into the dressing room and the team and the players and my wife uh, uh, were singing in the dressing room for three hours before they went to the post-game function and nobody wanted to leave the dressing room so the, that was a, a highlight and the the other thing of course is that from a personal perspective I had, I had sons playing um, so you know my wife was videotaping the game and Patrick was there and my three sons were involved or Brendan and Kevin were playing and Owen was on the bench and so it was all around the from a rugby perspective and a uh, a community perspective and a family perspective it was a highlight and then I suppose the other major highlight would have been uh, we had a team in 2000 we had sorry, the, the, the pack of forwards that played in 2005 and subsequently over a number of years I think they were better than the Canadian forwards the, they were the team that they were putting out they were very 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 good players and uh, had a very natural way of being able to play uh, scrums and the, the unit skills, the scrums, the lineups, the driving malls, the rocking, the patterning to the game. They were very good players. Bensmore and Frank Walsh and Chris Mooney and uh, Andrew Fagan and Kevin and Sean O'Leary. Like they were, they're good players. And then in 2010, we kind of had to open up to uh, using the Atlantic region and it was really driven by Newfoundland players again and they won a national championship when everybody was involved including BC and uh, played a very good quality game of rugby in that period of time I think we were we were uh, played, played lovely rugby I thought and then I think the other highlight was uh, I was last year was a, a highlight as well because our under 19 team won a national championship at home. Um, having spent six years in preparation, really, they had a lot of preparation put into them. And the reason it was a highlight is that um, they they played extraordinarily well in, in bad weather, in raining weather uh, at a very skillful level. Um, I was pr very impressed with that. Yeah, for sure. That was a pretty, that's a moment that a lot of people, not just the players and the team and the management will remember all Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. I, there's a photo there out there of Michael McCarthy and it's just a great photo out there. Um, I guess the last question I kind of have, and then I'll hand it over to Mr. Powers is um, why would you recommend youth and people to play the sport of rugby? Well, I think that uh, if, you'd, if you're not interested in playing a contact sport, well, you shouldn't be bothered playing rugby. So the, 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 the part of being able to play a contact sport skillfully um, and is an attraction to start with. And then the second thing is, is that the ethos of the game is uh, superior and the friendships, as Davey was saying earlier, the kind of camaraderie that exists in rugby and the, desi the, the desire to meet your opposition and have a drink with your opposition and in particular the, the desire for the team itself to have a drink with themselves 
at regular intervals um is 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 a, it's a really a social sport that uh, gives you the opportunity to test yourself at the highest level and at the at the at the kind of social level it gives you something that you can um make friends with and they, these friendships last for a long time and the big games that you win i keep saying this when you come back and you know when you're 65 years of age the guys you played with are the fellows that you want to have a drink with and they'll still be talking about what they did in ireland 1985 listen to davy wells for god's sake and i bet you timmy powers is exactly the same he would be talking about 1987 uh, he still talks about 1987 timmy powers does you can't shut him up Yeah, for sure. So on that note, I guess, of uh, Mr. Powers, um, we're going to introduce now to uh, the program webinar that an aspect that we haven't talked much about, Pat, yet tonight is your involvement with Rugby Canada. So you've been involved in pretty much every single level of, this, of the organization, and I couldn't think of anybody better to ask some questions about your involvement and maybe some of the 1987 memories could be relived again tonight is uh, Mr. Tim Powers, who is a proud Newfoundlander and the current chairman of Rugby Canada. So I'll hand it over to you, Tim, there now. I'll unmute you. I think you have your video up. Just one second. Don't tell me that Tim was unmuted. Oh, I heard all I heard all your bullshit, Pat. And then it's been days since I've been updated on it. I see looking over your right shoulder, you have books that captured the recent world rugby election, D-Day in blood and sand. But uh, we can get into that in a minute. I'm just disappointed you didn't share your big highlight from last year, which was the uh, Rugby World Cup in, in Tokyo and your dates on the, on the final day were myself, Al Noel and Alan Vance and four Newfoundlanders and a would-be Newfoundlander. It was, uh, it was quite the day. Well, Sharon has got a Newfoundland cap. He's a Newfoundlander. He, he, he is Mike, indeed. He carried Mike Yetman's bags on his first tour. <laughs> and he still talks about that. Uh, Liam set it up well. Uh, I, I think one of the things you've done deliberately, and uh, and it was witnessed in, in, in that event in Tokyo, is made sure that Newfoundlands had a voice on the national stage. Why did you want to do it, and how did you go about doing that? Well, um, I was asked to coach Canada in 1996, um, uh, prob probably as a result of Newfoundland teams doing fairly well. And uh, they were, I suspect they were a bit suspicious of my personality, of my character. And they put, they put in several minders to try and make sure I functioned properly or acted well, but um, they didn't succeed. But in any event, I, I coached the team at the World Cup in 99. And what was clear to me at that World Cup was that we had a very good team, short one or two positions, but they, that they, they didn't have the preparation or the games that were necessary to compete at the top level. And if they had, if we had the, the type of preparation necessary and the capacity to have a full team of decent players, that we do pretty well. And we didn't, right? We failed. As a result, we lost to Fiji and we could have gone to the quarterfinals. Um, and my take on it was that we needed to change the system, um, get more games into Canada at a higher level, get, get Canadian teams, Canadian players to get more experience um, and to have better preparation. So I, <clears throat> unfortunately, I got into rugby politics which is the kind of, I kind of regretted it. It was the worst time of my life, I have to tell you, um, because I'm sure you've had similar days, but you know, there was a, it was an, a, a kind of an aggressive, uh, aggressively functioning campaign in terms of trying to get change on the board. And then uh, after I became president, a sufficient number of people resigned that I ended up that year having to take in a, a vast amount of responsibility despite the fact that I was a doctor. Mm -hmm. I, it was really difficult. And then um, I was president for three years and, pa, pa, and you know, felt that I'd done my bit and need to be taken over by somebody else. Um, but the reason that I got involved with uh, politics in Canada was entirely related to the, um, the way that I perceived those players in 99 has been players with potential who didn't get the preparation that they deserved. 
And do you think that's changed? Have you seen outcomes then as a consequence of that? No, well, to some extent, well, I have to say that it's it's been, uh, um, uh, some things have been disappointing in that to, to compete in the national stage, you need to have a, a proper functioning under 20 program. You need a proper functioning academy, a residential academy. And you need a series of games that are available for that 30 or 40 players that are potentially able to play for Canada. And uh, the reality is, is that our under 20 program has been poor for the last five or six years. And uh, before that, there wasn't a huge amount available to them. It's much better, I think, now in the last two years. The, the uh, academy, the resident, residential academy got canned about, I don't know, like, um, 10 years ago or something like that, um, which was in a, a massive mistake that, uh, that was allowed to lapse. Mm -hmm. And it's been brought back now to for for uh, Rugby Canada in Victoria, and has a, an excellent coach in Jamie Cudmore, and is likely to have a big effect. I think. I, I, in fact, I think that one of the reasons that we had such a good team in the in the two uh, thousands was that a lot of our players have gone to the the Pride program, and uh, were made better players as a result of going to the Pride program and came back to play for us, and. Uh, played very well as a result and then the other pieces that would make so, so those things were uh, a problem for a number of years until very until recently really and then you had sevens um, became bigger than 15s and of course I don't agree with that uh, I, I don't agree with uh, players uh, we don't have enough players to be able to mm -hmm. have an independent sevens team and an independent 15s team and uh, and it show it showed um, at this World Cup and that there was a lot of sevens players were not playing in that World Cup team. So we've we've been to some extent we've uh, created our own um, precipitous downfall. But at the same time, I think that uh, in the last number of years we've rectified those pathways. And uh, this year, I would have thought that under twenty, the residency program, the pride. Um, the NLR, uh, the, the a new Canadian team, and uh, a better relationship with the sevens and fifteens players. Um, that all that signified that we were going to get better. So you talked a little bit about the politics of rugby. We can get to the world rugby stuff in a minute. You and I have talked enough about that. I'm sure nobody else wants to hear too much about it. But what it did signify, I think, that there's always in rugby this streak of populism. Um, and certainly you took advantage of that, arguably, with Agents of Change in 2000. What is it about rugby that there's always this populism, this desire to go against the status quo, even if the status quo may be working? What about the sport attracts that, uh, that strain? <laughs> well, it, it attracts it, it attracts in Canada for sure, right? So you've got you've got the, 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 the you've got a, a batch of people that would, no matter what you did, would be critical of it. There'll be something to criticize. Um, I think that if you're not successful, you're going to get criticized. Um, and uh, I think that there were justifiable criticisms of uh, Canadian rugby. For the for the twenty years after professionals professionalism started, so I was the first coach in the professional era, and we were really you know you know running up mountains trying to catch up with the other countries, and it's 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 gotten worse. Um, so that, that that capacity to compete against the top twelve has diminished, and people hark back to the time in the nineties when we were capable of competing with them. Uh, so I think that those th th those people who think we should be still able to play as we did in the 90s um, can justifiably criticize uh, at, at least when we're not able to have an under 20 program and a prior program and a fixture list for the players to get better. Um, I think then you, f you find out then is that some people will criticize no matter what you do. And I think that I think that election between Pichot and Beaumont, it, it, you had that issue of populism and people thinking that uh, bring in a fellow who can change the, everything, break it up, and that the the uh, the more 
sober candidate would uh, would 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 not be elected. We, we we've talked about it. We've put out a little bit of a release on, but maybe a little bit more thought uh, and exposition as why why you thought and why we all agreed uh, after a lot of discussion that that Bill Beaumont was a good choice for chair and, and a good choice for Canada. Well, I think there's a number of things that you got to take into account. Uh, I think uh, one is is that the first major question is is this a good thing for Canada uh, that Beaumont would be uh, the chairman instead of Pichot? Um, and uh, th their manifestos were similar. Um, I, I thought that uh, Beaumont was a, a very reliable, uh, um, avuncular, reasonable guy who followed through on what he said. Um, so to, on a character level, um, I thought that uh, I, you couldn't criticize uh, Beaumont. Uh, and on his manifesto, you couldn't criticize him. Then on a, 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 a the, 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 the past history of England's support of Canada for 40 years, the, their funding of the Churchill Cup affected the eight, debt of three or four million dollars. Um, the fact that they, they certainly come to Canada at regular intervals, that you need to have a very good reason for not supporting the candidate from England. Um, that support you for for 40 years. And then in the COVID-19 era, where we're going to come out of this uh, week uh, and that we need support to get back on our feet, uh, I would think that the most likely country in the world to support Canada would be England. Um, so they, they're kind of some of the major reasons that I was was would recommend Bill Beaumont. So uh, Liam, appreciating we got what about nine minutes ago, two quick last little questions and I'll hand it back to, to you, Liam. Um, so out of that election, and it, it has a trickle down effect or maybe a huge impact, as you say, because of COVID-19 and everything else, uh, great discussion around reform. Uh, you have often expressed both uh, publicly and privately some of the frustrations you've had at, at World Rugby and, and how World Rugby works. So the two-part question, maybe a quick overview from your perspective, how World Rugby works and what does reform look like? What really can be accomplished? So World Rugby is a bureaucracy that makes an enlarged amount of money from, from the World Cup and distributes that money over the ensuing three or four years and it in, in, tries to ensure that teams are more competitive at the World Cup and supports the tier two countries. But the reality is, is that the foundation countries get the bulk of the money because they, they're also not, they're also a bit fragile. You can see that when Australia's gone bankrupt, nearly gone bankrupt. Um, and uh, so there is, there is that tension between what money you'd put, excuse me, what money you'd put into the tier two countries that have to improve if rugby has become any type of a, an attractive sport, you're going to need more than 12 countries competing. Um, and uh, um, so I'm losing track now there. Um, what does reform look like? Where, do, where does it need to go? Where does world, what does rugby, world rugby need to do yeah, now? Yeah, so, I, yeah, so just to follow through with that, I'm just saying it's, I, it's a bureaucracy and yep. they have very strong people who come up with the plans to deal with the various countries, but it's driven by the amount of money that can be used. The, the governance structure is that of a, an executive committee that um, has the power to advise the, uh, the CEO on decisions, just like Can Rugby Canada. And then you've got a council that has no influence, that meets twice a year for two hours and presses buttons and puts their hand up. So council has no influence um, and the issues that arise in rugby like these these issues between Pichot representing the southern hemisphere and Beaumont representing the northern hemisphere they have never been discussed at mm -hmm. council never and they should be right they, there should be a way of being able to to uh, resolve the issue of a global game and the various other issues that came into into effect with the between Pichot and Beaumont and in effect between the Southern Hemisphere and the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so the, the, the piece that I think that me being on council is that I have been the slightest interest in, in being window dressing. You know, I, 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 mean, I, I want to do something mm -hmm. and I've been, it's just been a waste of time. So I think that the, the, the need to 
get a role for a council that involves them in strategic decisions for the for the, the world game. So for, for instance, uh, you take um, things that might improve the game, right? So there's a four or five things that I think would improve the game. Uh, I support I, certainly. I support the kicking outside the twenty-two, bouncing to touch. Uh, you, you get the ball back. Now that that's been driven by that's been trialed and driven by the rules committee, but uh, we had no influence on it. The council had no influence on it. For, we have eight substitutes. South Africa had five second rows in their squad in the final, and three front row forwards. Mm. So, so they replaced six of their pack mm-hmm. in the last half hour. Mm-hmm. That's not appropriate. So mm-hmm. that means that they they can put massive donkeys out there and replace them with more massive donkeys. So I don't support the substitution rule. I think that the people they should have four substitutes, and they, most of the players have got to go eighty minutes. And that would diminish the size issue because they'd have to be fit and they'd have to be far fitter and they'd be picking more agile players to last 80 than to be picking monsters. Um, so, And then the other one is that uh, players that play for France and England and New Zealand from the tier two countries, particularly Fiji, Simone, Tonga, and uh, they're discarded after one or two caps and they never play international rugby again. Those guys should be allowed to play for their 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 country. So after a period, you, you don't want to stop them making a livelihood. So that, that, that's why I wouldn't say you should never allow them to play. So you've got a five year int- a period where you have to be resident. If you get picked for your, that country, then fine, make your money. But if you get dropped, go back to your tier two country. It would make a far better uh, um, contest between Fiji and. Wales in a World Cup or in Samoa, etc. Right. And um, so there are those types of, but we've had no influence in that. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the issues that have arisen between the Southern Hemisphere and the Northern Hemisphere, I think driven a bit by the global game, the global schedule, but also driven by the fact that there's less money in the Southern Hemisphere than it is in the Northern Hemisphere, has never been discussed at council. Right. So you've had this political battle between the Southern Hemisphere represented by Pichot and the Northern Hemisphere represented by Beaumont without any engagement with council, right? So you could, a lot of these types of things could have could be resolved by having giving council a role in strategic decision-making. Um, and that's that part of the governance thing I would strongly support. So last question for me, and I just say before I ask it, uh, for all that are listening and watching, won't surprise you, um, Pat's provided great guidance and led with integrity in a very difficult election period where, uh, let us just say, there was blood, sand, bullets, and everything else firing through, and, and we got through it, and I believe we did make the right choice in the end. But uh, just to sign off with this question, you talked about, and I think you're right, all of the challenges that COVID-19 presents. It's a great restart, the great correction. What are the opportunities COVID-19 might provide both for rugby in Newfoundland and in Canada? Well, I think that if you were able to extend the game in localities um, and that you were able to uh, get enough people to play and get competition, and in, in meaningful ways, and uh, you ended up playing that if we if it just meant that Newfoundland played the Atlantic provinces, but we did it properly, mm-hmm. the club played in the Atlantic provinces and did it properly, and there were there were more players playing, that's an opportunity for us, but it's also a threat. If we don't get more players, we die. Right. So, you know, you've got both ends of that stick. And then uh, when when the capacity to fly and the capacity to uh, uh, engage with re-engage with provinces, we'd be able to re-engage faster with Canadian provinces than we will be with the United States, for instance. Then maybe that will make us make, make uh, BC and Ontario engage more with with the likes of us. That would strengthen the game in Canada. Uh, and so you I mean you see Australia, New Zealand, or creating uh, opportunities to fly between those two countries and go nowhere else. So we'll end up being able to fly across Canada, but not being able to go very many other places. Um, and, and then uh, I think that, 
strengthening the bonds between our provinces, but also those countries that we normally engage with, we can strengthen those bonds. And I don't think we'd be getting back to a global game for a number of years, to be quite honest. That seems to be the case. Um, so I'll hand over to you, Liam. I just want to say this uh, again, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, for good or for bad, is well represented uh, nationally and internationally. Right now, I think we're at a historic moment, at least most of this group. Maybe Francois doesn't like it, but you know, Francois is okay. I see you there, Francois. Nice, handsome beard, by the way. Uh, but uh, the chair, the CEO, and the world rugby rep are all from Newfoundland and Labrador. I will say this that doesn't happen without Pat Parfrey, that doesn't happen without Noel Brown. One of the, the things I think I've shared with Pat, at least a number of cups in, but I'll share it with full sobriety now. You've been a great mentor to me and you've been a great mentor to, to many others. And we're all very lucky to uh, to have you. It's not the end of the world as we know it. I'm saying that because it's true. Thanks, Timmy. I'll just share a story with you when when uh, when we were when there was a bit of policy going on a while back. I, I was overheard a fella said it. If it, if it wasn't if it wasn't for those two fucking islands, we'd be far better off. <laughs> They're talking about Newfoundland and Vancouver Island. <laughs> they may not have been wrong. Thank you. Over to you, Liam. Great on organizing this, by the way. Perfect. Thanks, Tim. Um, so what we're going to do now, just to, before we sign off, and we greatly appreciate everyone for their participation. We have a few questions here from some of the people that are into the Zoom call. So I'm just gonna put those to Pat now. And if anyone has any questions for Pat before we sign off, please put up your hand. You can privately message it to me. But first off, we have a question here from Paul Newhook. So I'm gonna unmute him here now. And I don't know, Paul, if you wanna turn your video on, it is entirely up to you. Are you there, Paul? I'm here and uh, <clears throat> I'm sitting in the dark, so I'll leave my video off. Uh, I do. Uh, uh, most people here know what I look like, and uh, I'm sure they probably appreciate me keeping it off. Um, I do want to thank you guys for the forum as well, and it was a great chat about Rugby Canada and some of the issues faced uh, by Canada uh, in the world stage. But to roll it back, I guess, to a local uh, flavor, we are facing challenges here, of course, that most of us know about. and. Uh, you know, we've been around, some of us, for 40 years, uh, believe it or not. And uh, when we started, there were four clubs. And today, we're struggling to make sure that four clubs at least remain. We've certainly had a lot of successes, but we face tremendous challenges. And, you know, my question and concern, I've got four kids uh, who are involved in rugby and uh, I'll make sure that they do uh, stay involved. We can't keep the game going by just reproducing more rugby players. Uh, how, do we, how do we grow our numbers? And Timmy, since you're there, um, you know, what can Rugby Canada do to help us grow the sport that we all love right here at home? Because you know, we've, we've been around 40 years and uh, like I say, a lot of successes, but you know, our number, our number challenges remain. So, you know, what's the key, Pat, do you see and what can Rugby Canada do? Rugby Canada can do nothing. It's entirely to do with what we do locally. Um, so, uh, I mean, the game started because of the uh, um, passion of Noel Brown. And uh, I suppose that I might have helped to, to get it to a higher level at, at some level. But the, the reality is, is that uh, 70 year olds like me and Noel Brown are not going to be able to um, maintain and develop the game. The game is going to be is totally dependent on the younger people coming into the game. Uh, not only the, the, the younger players having an ambition, but those people in their 40s and 50s who benefit from the game have, have got to do the hard work. Mm -hmm. And they're the people who need to identify players and help schools and, and, uh, and uh, raise money and pick up the torch and carry it uh, it's difficult right i know it's difficult i've been through all that before i mean there were times when i was involved with it that i i could hardly sleep during the summertime because we were we, you know you were bringing teams to various places and you're coaching the teams then you got to raise the money and you got players out there who can't afford to do what you got to do and you're taking financial risks that are fairly large 
well, you know, uh, the, 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 the responsibility now rests on those 40 and 50 year olds. And the problem I have is, is that Canadians in general, uh, they don't, uh, they don't really give back. Um, mm -hmm. They disappear. And that's part of the reason that our game is professionalized here. So we're dependent on Simon Blanks and, uh, and Morgan Lovell to do the stuff that volunteers have done in the past. But those, and they do a good job. And they, those guys, they're not capable of, of uh, creating a, a, a community sport without the, without the active engagement of players who've benefited from the sport in the past. So, I mean, from what I hear, uh, you know, you mentioned the schools, um, you know, be, beyond that. And what does that mean? Getting bodies in the school to promote, promote the sport and uh, engage the teachers. What does that look like? Well, I, I actually think that there's a fairly decent infrastructure in, in, this, in the schools at the moment. Um, you've got good players coming out of Gonzaga and Holy Heart and Holy Spirit and uh, and, and, and some other schools. And the reason they work is that Baz Crosby, that's his life, is to get players out of Holy Spirit. Mark McCarthy is to very much engaged in Holy Heart. Densmore has done a huge amount of work in Holy Heart. Gonzaga is a, is a, is a, uh, a source of players that they, they want to play. So it's, it's the infrastructure that we provide them, that we help the schools. We don't need to be engaging the teachers. The players are coming out. We need to give the players a good experience, give them very good coaching, and be totally reliable. Uh, Snooks, I would just add, it's good that you're in the dark, but if you look at the uh, the list of people here that are on tonight, it's the people, uh, most people who are already involved in rugby, right? And uh, I agree with everything Pat said. There's a huge challenge with volunteers. Quick example, uh, we just had a call at the national level, a call for members to join Rugby Canada. I appreciate we're not the sexiest or maybe the most popular organization in the world. We made the call across all of Canada. We're moving to a skills-based board. One person put up their hand. Uh, this is a time when we need a lot of people putting up their hand because it's tough out there. The only other two points I would make, um, one harks back to the World Rugby election. One of the things P. Show had right uh, is using gaming and, and modern technology. He proposed a new rugby video game. Things like that matter. They connect to different generations. Uh, and credit to Bill Webb and, and many uh, who are involved in the Toronto Arrows, professional rugby, it being on television, having people, uh, having something to aspire to, seeing local players play, uh, all of those things are important. But as Pat said, you need the foot soldiers on the ground to take advantage of any momentum that's created by those tools and, and, uh, and engagements. Thanks, Gus. Yep, thanks, Paul. That's a very good question. Um, Pat, so we have a question here. As you know, we have a form of a touch program on the West Coast, the West Coast Wanderers, a Cornerbrook Touch Rugby League. They were in here at the George Street Festival 7s here at Swathers last summer. Do you have any um, thoughts or ideas on what they, what we can be done by the Newfoundland Labrador Rugby Union Board and this organization to further the sport, maybe to grow it on the West Coast. And any ideas there? That's what they are wondering. Well, I mean, we've had an eternal problem trying to uh, get get the rugby involved in sites that are outside St. John's, uh, and uh, because they're the, of the, the, the of the distance and the fact that you need twenty three players to have a proper rugby team. It makes it difficult in smaller communities. And again, I go back to this issue of volunteers. The only, the, the only way that we can, that they can survive is by having strong volunteers. And the fact that they've got those players together is fantastic. There's, and there's a, there's a kid out there, I, I've forgotten his name, a big, big uh, midfield back who's played with us. Um, but Adam, uh, but the, you know, the, the way that we can go forward, I think is, is that those guys have got to get competition and they got to get a response from the clubs in, uh, in, uh, on the Avalon Peninsula and they need to go out to them. Right. So, and I think that's a feasible thing. There was a, there was a team in Harbor Grace, you know, 20 years ago. And <clears throat> the difficulty is, is the maintenance of it. And the maintenance revolves entirely around volunteers. If you've got, if you've got 
enthusiastic volunteers who are reliable that the pe players like, the game survives. And the, our, I don't know if the Newfoundland Rugby Union can do anything for them. It's the, it's the clubs that would go and play it against them would do something about it. Yeah, for sure. Our um, director, Simon Blanks, was actually out there last uh, spring, too. Um, we have a question here from Brandon Chase. So I'll just unmute him so he can ask him it, ask you the question himself. So, Brandon, you're unmuted there now, buddy. Thank you. Um, I want to say uh, not a question, just a statement. Um, your son, uh, Pat Parfrey, said uh, something to me downtown one time. And that was, uh, he said, I've been through a lot of my life, but I, I remember I met you, uh, I used to try out for rugby a while ago, I was probably under 18, I was 19, and uh, anyway, I just want to say, I've been through a lot of since then, uh, I got a very bad car crash, and you said something nice about me, with that, so thank you very much, Pat Parfrey, thank you. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, Brandon. And I guess we'll end on um, not a funny note, but someone was asking, you have a bookshelf behind you, Pat. What's your favorite book on the bookshelf? <laughs> I'll do a lot of reading. Um, I can, there's a lot of books that like, I think Five Days in Memorial is a fantastic book. It's about uh, a hospital in, in New Orleans after the hurricane, hurricane Katrina in 2005. It's about the ethical issues of, uh, it's about the hurricane, but it's also about the ethical issues who survives in hospitals when they're put under pressure. It's a fantastic book. Perfect. Well, that's all we have. So on behalf of the entire, everyone that's logged in, everyone that viewed this on YouTube, we're going to have to put it, we're going to put it up on our Facebook page. We'll be able to, sh we'll be sure to share that. Uh, we greatly appreciate your time, Pat, uh, Tim, it's very uh, useful for keeping the profile of the sport here alive in Newfoundland Labrador. And we greatly appreciate your time and your contributions to the sport. Um, I guess on that then, next week, we're going to have another webinar. We're in the process of firming that up. So we'll be sure to put that out there for all of you to hopefully tune into that. And on Saturday, we've had a game of rugby. We've gone back through our archives and we're having a watch party slash premiere on Facebook every week around 8 p.m. So make sure to tune into our Facebook page that this week. And I'll leave it over to you, Pat and Tim, if you have any final comments. Well, I, I, I've got a comment. I think it's great that Davey Wells is on the line and uh, thought it was important enough to do that. And uh, for Timmy to, Timmy to do the same thing. Um, and I have no idea. There's 55 people who've been on the call. I, I don't know where you get the names of them. Uh, so I'd be actually quite interested in seeing who, the, who, who those people were. But it's far bigger uh, number of people than I thought would be on it. Um, but I, I do think that uh, there's going to be a challenge for Newfoundland rugby and uh, in the next few years. And the solution to it is those people who have benefited from the game the last 40 years. They're the solution. Yeah, and I would say here, here to that, and uh, there's lots of people on this line, as, as Pat said, who are already putting their hand up. And, and you, Liam, I want to pay special thanks to you. I think you've done great things with social media, bringing rugby uh, and keeping it alive in this difficult time and more of your generation, too. It's not just what happens on the field. Lots of us have had brief moments of fame like 1987, uh, but uh, but have enjoyed so much of rugby and uh what you're doing, what others do, and keep it up. And if we can ever do anything for you, let us know. And thank you. I want to tell Perfect. you. This, I want to tell you a story about 1987. Oh Jesus! That was one of the. Was not, I'm not going to embarrass you, Tim. That was that was what the one of the most important um, events that occurred in Newfoundland rugby because it put a a, 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 a national championship in St John's on a major stage, and it 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 uh, the fact that we got to the final and played so well. Uh, and created a lot of publicity that we got a lot of players came into the game as a result. Uh, and it was a, it was a memorable year, but it, my little story is, is, uh, is more straightforward. I was actually commentating on the game. Right. Noel Brown was coaching and uh, the, uh, one of our players went offside in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the overtime. I can't remember 
Or was Dave O'Keefe. Dave O'Keefe. Oh, Jesus, he's gone offside. On <laughs> <laughs> public television. That's my <laughs> <laughs> perfect well thank you everyone for joining in we'll talk to you soon stay safe um stay healthy uh keep washing your hands and practicing social distancing and we'll hopefully be back on the pitch very soon thank you all